Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Like I said in the introduction, I'm here with Chris O'Donnell with CWP Energy Solutions. Chris, welcome to the show. Ben, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be on here and I'm definitely following up a, a pretty star-studded cast, so hopefully I can hold my own. <laughs> well, I'm I'm excited to have you on and yeah, we've we've had some pretty awesome heavy hitting uh, guests on the show. I have no doubt whatsoever that you will live up to that, uh, probably exceed that. You know, I'm Chris, I'm also really excited. This is actually, for the name of the show, the very first actual happy hour recording. Um, so cheers, virtual cheers for the, the listeners. We're, we're doing this virtual and um, we both have a beer in hand, which is phenomenal and a great way to end the day. So Chris, Certainly. what I'd love to start with is I... I, what I like to do is kind of lay out a, a background for the the audience so that they can better understand where you're coming from and, and what your experience is. So can you maybe walk us through some of your professional background? What led you to CWP Energy Solutions? And then also, I always love hearing, how did you get into Bitcoin mining? Yeah, for, for me, it's a, maybe a little bit more of a visual track than others, but um... My, my uncle was heavily involved in trading, and I was always very attracted to, to all the red and green colors and just the chaos. Um, could this be more, more the ADD speaking? But um, <laughs> in, in the end, uh, I went to Rutgers. Uh, I, I did finance and economics there. Um, and to me, I always wanted to go into the trading route. I was working as a statistical analyst at uh, PSE&G, um, the large utility in New Jersey. Um, and did quite a bit of work for them, but always had ambitions um, to go on to the energy trading floor and fortunately got a position, um, became an, an analyst there. And my job there was basically take all of the different aspects of the energy trading business, load side, generation side, and actual trading side, um, and then figure out how much money we made that day. Um, and so that really got me into the weeds of a lot of the ISO tariffs, the regulations of the market, um, what works, what doesn't go work, and um, essentially, you know, kept going there um, and went on to um, become one of the 24-7 traders. Um, in that role, we managed a lot of assets um, from small trash burning assets all the way up to you know, small hydro and solar wind. Um, and then all the way up to coal, gas, and nuclear. Um, so on those shifts, you're working either 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. or 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. There's no such thing as weekends. There's no such thing as holidays. You grow pretty, pretty uh, close with the people that you're working with, but you get to see so many different days in the energy markets and so many different conditions, and that really um, builds a strong groundwork and you know, how the markets work, how people earn money how people lose money. Um, and yeah. that kind of yeah. started to facilitate the whole um, process and what's become today. Um, so from that moment, um, I went and, uh, and um, left and went to an environmental um, commodities trading shop. Um, and I was tasked with, with building a power and gas trading business for them. Um, the only catch, um, I had to synergize with their environmental um, commodities trading business. So that really opened up the black box of solar, wind, rex, basis risk, curtailment, where do I cite my project? Mm -hmm. And I think working with a lot of those clients to help them reduce their risks, um, teach them how to extract or diversify their revenue streams, built this vision for what has now become CWP Energy Solutions. Um, so. I left that company in uh, you know, just before, in about 2020. Um, I went to, to build this vision uh, on my own with two private equity guys um, and then realized that the amount of collateral and expertise, um, we really needed to, to diversify. And um, I went to a, a lot of different companies and funds. And in the end, I thought CWP uh, Energy had a fantastic reputation by being, you know, a large data backed and focused shop. They were extremely uh, qualified at quantitative trading 
I thought they had a lot of the data infrastructure and expertise in-house to really position ourselves well for the grid of the future. And the grid of the future is renewable intermittency, it's decreasing base load generation, um, and it's increasing volatility severity. And you need a lot of expertise and a lot of backing, um, both you know statistically, data-wise, but also, you know, human touch wise to, to kind of navigate that. So that's what brought me uh, into CWP. And, and now I head up the client facing business, um, which is called CWP Energy Solutions, which I'm sure we'll get into. Yeah, we, we will. We certainly will. Um, that couple of things in there that are, are just wild to think about. So it was literally 24 seven, 365 trading that that's pretty wild. I, <laughs> I, I'm not in the trading world, so I mean, hearing that is like that—that's brand new news to me. Yeah, in, in the end, electricity is twenty-four-seven. I think a lot of people are shocked to to hear that, but you know, you're sitting on a desk with two or three other guys making decisions that have you know tens to a hundred million dollar impact by yourself, and you know what you start to learn um, is through mistakes uh, and opportunities very quickly. So, it, you know, I strongly encourage anyone and when we're looking to hire people, people that come from a 24-7 desk background, I think that puts them leaps and bounds ahead of other people that, that have maybe come um, from, from different backgrounds uh, just due to that kind of strenuous work. Yeah, well, I can absolutely see that. I mean, they've been stress tested to the max. Um, what facilitated Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining into your career path? Because... Your focus at CWP, or one of the things that you guys are, are helping ushering in, is Bitcoin mining and and really this flexible load. What uh, what got you into that? Great question. Um, yeah, certainly uh, wasn't uh, on my uh, on my career path uh, when you look back to that move in 2020. Um, but I'd say uh, in 2021 is when um, I helped found CWP Energy Solutions um, with um, my boss and CWP Energy's president, uh, Alain Brisois. And the mandate was to focus on building a renewable energy client book and helping augment asset management teams at renewable energy companies to better manage their risk. And it just so happened there was just this little event called Winter Storm Yuri um, that happened during that. And that really threw us right into the fire. And we helped several clients um, that had these fixed gate hedges. So and essentially, if their asset is not generating, they have a net short position in ERCOT. And we helped them navigate through all of that chaos that that ensued from winter storm yori and successfully doing that we had a lot of these clients come and say hey you you guys need to commercialize this business you know there's a need in the market the renewable developers are building projects at, as fast as they can and they have some of them have their own internal asset management teams but they need trading expertise and data to help make those decisions, to help manage these risks. And that started to parlay into, you know, hey, can you help me on the long term with my power purchase agreements? Mm -hmm. um, can you help me? My node has been, you know, in single digits or in negative territory. Um, and we actually had um, some deeper uh, win PPAs that we were looking to um, find a buyer for. And so I started putting some feelers out there and uh, miners actually started, you know, reaching out and saying, Hey, I, I know that you guys are focused on managing curtailment risk for wind assets and we would love to fight a mine there. And my whole thought process was like, well, we have this PPA. Would you be willing to, to buy it? And they're offering, higher dollars than anyone else was and then everything changed um, right before the miami bitcoin conference in 2021 and essentially gas prices natural gas prices went through the roof yep our cpa almost quadrupled in value 
and that was no longer on the table to be sold. But we were still managing a lot of curtailment risks, and miners reached out and said, hey, you know, we'd love to, you know, partner on some of your client projects. And oh, by the way, do you have any power data? Um, do you work in, you know, the power space and can help us navigate this? And uh, I reluctantly got a blessing from our senior leadership to go to the Bitcoin conference in Miami and, and have the conversations with folks. Um, and, and the rest is history, uh, I think. Um, I'll give a shout out to, to, to Cam uh, from Foundry. He, uh, he has comes from an energy background, but we were able to kind of cipher or translate, you know, through that and, um, and started to build a, a relationship that, that's well known with Foundry right now. And, um, and now we work with, with several miners kind of navigating the space and making our power data available and, and going from there. Oh, that's fantastic. I, what I, what's cool about how this all came, you know, onto your plate or, or, you know, even, even just became a, a, a industry that you were interested in is because it, they approached you in this most current role. Um, and then CWP energy had the flexibility and the wherewithal to, to adapt it and, and let you run with it. So that, that's really exciting to hear that. Um, it, it's always nice to hear when the companies, you know, are, are open to, I mean, Bitcoin mining, it's, it's new and it's, uh, it's not something that the energy industry, especially the renewable industry has ever seen before. I mean, it's, it's a completely new beast. Um, so that's, that's awesome. With that being said, so you guys are, you know, really front and center on the energy energy industry. You mentioned, you know, building out that renewable book. Where do you see the energy industry evolving over two, five, ten years? There is a huge mandate from the president to expand renewable projects and be carbon neutral or carbon free. What is the evolution look like and how does Bitcoin mining play a role in that? The billion it's a big dollar question. question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, you know, from from where we see, um, after what happened last year, we see a full reset in the market. You know, gas prices have come down um, on the Bitcoin side. Bitcoin went through a lot of volatility. Miners went through a lot of volatility. Um, those that came out the other side, I think you have to tip your cap to them. Um, and on the energy industry side, you obviously have the Inflation Reduction Act um, that is facilitating a lot of investment, both public and private. Um, and then you have the big, I guess, maybe bottleneck, which was last year's bottleneck was the supply chain. This year's bottleneck and, you know, more probably last year's bottleneck, too, is, is the interconnection. You know, mm. there's so much money that wants to invest in renewable energy facilitate product uh, projects getting built, but there's only so many projects that can be built. And if you look around and see all of the renewable energy companies that are popping up or even the large incumbents, um, and you look at a lot of the studies that are coming about, about 20% of projects actually get built. And there are a lot of um, reforms that are coming along that can help expedite and facilitate the process. Um, but in the end, you know, that's going to be a, a slow moving process. So what's really happening is you have a lot of your base load coal um, sticking around because of, you know, the past, you know, year and a half, two years, um, you know, base load coal was, was relied upon heavily um, to keep voltage control on the system um, and also to you know, more or less keep the lights on. And now once we've kind of come out of that cycle, you see a lot of the push to retire some of these plants. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of incentives for battery storage to be built out. And fair enough, you know, in states like California, we're seeing a lot of storage. Um, ERCOT is, you know, kind of been pushing as the next state to, to really um, incentivize battery storage. Um, and then, of course, what we see is a ton of renewable and solar build out. Um, despite the delays. And what that means for us in the grid of the future is a lot more renewable intermittency. And if you have that base load hole 
or base load generation coming offline, that's going to mean increasing volatility severity, albeit with decreasing volatility frequency. Mm -hmm. And what that means is most people who have assets, whether it's a Bitcoin mine, a data center, battery storage, wind, solar, those people need energy expertise in order to manage the fluctuations in the market. And I don't think it's a secret to anyone that knows nothing about our industries that weather events, these one in 100 weather events are occurring yep. more and more frequently. Yes. So yep. it really comes down to when you have a grid that is balanced with a lot more volatility um, and the stakes are higher and there's a lot of, you know, capital investment that's taking place. So how are you positioning yourself to manage through a bad cycle? Because if there's anything we know about the Bitcoin side of things and the Bitcoin mining industry and the energy industry, one thing is true. These markets are cyclical and the cyclical nature of the market is going to continue. Yeah. And I see, you know, two years from now, we're probably looking at a similar grid to today. Five years from now, we're looking at, you know, sometimes in, uh, or I should say, five years from now, we're probably looking at some days of about 90% of renewables powering, you know, markets like SVP, maybe even ERCOT for that. And what happens if the wind doesn't come in as high as expected, or there's a bit more cloud cover um, that limits the solar production? You know, what are those dumps in prices going to do? Um, and if you don't have resources that can balance out the grid, like controllable loads or like storage um, and participate in those types of programs, then the grid is going to be you know, pretty constrained um, in what it can do. Sure. Yeah. And that, that all makes sense. So I, I see what you mean. So, you know, five years from now, there's going to be, you know, a lot of those projects coming to completion, renewable projects, that is. And, you know, with those, you're going to have flexible load that enables them to smooth out the ups and downs there. Just quick checking question. The, the, that mechanism is Bitcoin mining, keeping peaker plants running smoothly so that they don't have like ups and down fluctuations, and then they come offline when the peaker plant needs to direct their energy to the grid. Is that is that what you mean by smoothing out that intermittency from renewables? Yeah, I think it, it's two separate things. Uh, I think you bring up a good point there. You know, peaker plants are going to be increasingly necessary on the grid. You only have to look at California and, and see yes. the articles yeah. that have come yeah. out regarding the duck curve. You know, everyone's in a split camp on this, but, you know, we believe that the duck curve is coming to ERCOT and peaker plants are going to be relied on to, to serve those ramping spikes. Um, but what happens with the Bitcoin mining side of things is they provide a price floor and they provide stability during periods of high renewable penetration. And they keep that curtailed and stranded energy from turning off. And those investors, or I should say those project owners of wind or solar, they are beholden in the end of the day to tax equity investors and the corporate off takers or you know, whoever their off taker is, they have ESG mandates that they've promised to their public shareholders. So when the wind farm spins and produces their megawatt hour, it doesn't only produce a megawatt hour of energy, but it produces a production tax credit and it produces a renewable energy credit. And if the market signals via price, you know, negative 30, negative $40 prices for the wind farm or the solar yep. farm to curtail, that tax equity investor doesn't get his production tax credit that corporate off taker doesn't get their renewable energy credit. And that starts to put a strain on the whole financing system. And that's something that we look to address financially with 
our financial hedging and trading and offering strategies to the market. And that's something that Bitcoin mining does from the physical side. It goes into areas and it creates a long-term solution. So if you have wind farms, you know, one through five in your area and wind farm one has a Bitcoin mine or a data center or some type of controllable load on it and wind farms two through five don't, Mm -hmm. which one is the money going to flow to? And despite anyone's views on, on Bitcoin mining or Bitcoin in general, all of the financial investors would choose option one because that asset can run through curtailment periods and that asset is going to produce more production tax credits for them and it's going to be producing more rec for their off taker yep. and that that um, wind farm is going to be able to survive during periods of low gas prices and high wind and in the end it's about survival for a lot of these high renewable penetration areas more than it is about revenue. I'm so glad that you brought that up and I really appreciate you going into that because I I think the the renewable industry is going to wake up to that in a big way. I know that I mean that is what you guys are doing is you're you're bringing that solution set to this industry. So I'm excited to see that because I think it's really going to change the narrative around Bitcoin mining's energy use and what it's doing for the renewable sector and a lot of cool stuff in there. You brought up the duck curve. Chris, I'm from the Midwest. I'm in Minnesota. I don't know what that is. Just hard stop. I, I'm not even familiar with that. I've heard of it. I, I'd love for you uh, to give me and the audience what what is the duck curve. <laughs> yeah, so the duck curve actually does, does look like a duck, um, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> Um, and essentially what it is, and, and it really started out in California, California incentivized a lot of solar to come online. It's obviously a very attractive state for solar. And basically what happens is, you know, you have your load curve, which, you know, typically looks you know, like dip through the overnight period as people are sleeping, lights are off, companies are shut down as people wake up businesses start running, um, you know, aluminum smelters start running, you know, processing facilities start going, you know, you have increasing load in the morning, which is, I would refer to as a ramp hour. Um, And then during the middle of the day, um, you know, either there's people going out to lunch, you know, in the winter, there's, you know, strong dips um, as as businesses are kind of running as as usual. Um, In the summer, it's more of a, you know, increasing curve. There's you know, only one, uh, yeah, two peaks in the winter. There's only one peak in the summer. And essentially what the duck curve is, is, you know, when you get that, when you get past that ramping hour at seven, eight, nine a.m. in the morning, all of the solar comes online and there's yep. an oversupply in the market and there's not enough demand to soak up all of that solar generation. So what the market starts doing is sending increasingly less price signals and the price signals don't stop at zero as some people seem to think (laughs) they can go all the way down to severely negative pricing because the market is trying to signal to generators we do not need your generation we do not have enough demand for it yeah and the grid has to remain balanced at 60 hertz frequency at 60 hertz is when supply of generation equals demand for consumption of electricity. And so the duck curve essentially is saying the market is oversupplied. They're sending negative price signals, signaling these generators to, to turn down. And then, believe it or not, when the sun goes down, everyone gets home from work. There's a ramping hour in load. Um, the demand for electricity rises, but all of that free renewable generation is coming offline. Therefore, in order to you know, keep up in supply and keep the lights on, you need to start ramping up, um, like you brought up earlier, gas peaking plants, sometimes even oil plants, you know, anything that can ramp up quickly, um, which is what battery storage is, is being brought online to solve and smooth out that curve is what, uh, what's needed. And we're starting to see that in ERCOT right now too. 
There is a lot of renewal, uh, wind penetration in ERCOT. There's still a lot of base load, but there's still a tremendous amount of solar. And we're starting to see those ramping hours in the morning getting increasingly more pricey and in the mm. evening getting increasingly more pricey. So that means the spread between the lowest hours of the day and the highest hours of the day is getting increasingly wider. Yeah. So to summarize the duck curve, you have really high demand for electricity when the sun and the wind is not blowing or shining the strongest. And so you have wicked high demand when there's not a lot of generation and then not a lot of demand when the generation is peaking. Is that a good way to summarize that? That's a good way to summarize it. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate the walkthrough. I, I genuinely didn't know, you know, I've seen duck curve, this duck curve, that I, I think I even saw that, you know, Texas went through a, a pretty crazy little period where everyone in the state of Texas knows what the duck curve is because of it. Um, so thank you for that. I appreciate that. Well, you might get you might get a little bit more out of that because you know what what's happened and and what's everyone's silver bullet to to save the grid and and offset a lot of that transmission um, infrastructure spend that is needed um, is battery storage, um, and we'll get into to the controllable load side in a second. But battery storage is supposedly the the savior of the grid, and it does have a lot of benefits. But battery storage needs to be financed. And in order to have a financeable um, asset, you need you know, certain cash flows that are locked in. And so the most liquid hedging mechanism currently is called a, a top two, bottom two structure, where you're essentially locking in what you think the spread is between the lowest two hours, the price spread is between the lowest two hours of the day and the highest two hours of the day. And that can go anywhere from, you know, 50 to $60 a megawatt hour, in some cases even higher. And so now you're having the duck curve start to signal prices on the term to get battery storage assets built. So you're starting to see this snowball rolling down the hill and then you have Bitcoin mining on the opposite side mm -hmm. that can't necessarily generate, but it can defer its offtake and sell if it's co-located with a generating resource and sell that generation to the grid. Or it can provide ancillary services and really be that flexible load to help balance out the grid instead of incentivizing, you know, investment that may or may not be needed in, in some areas. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. Bitcoin mining, I think is really going to disrupt a lot of the, the thinking, like you said, around, around just battery storage in general and, and all of it, um, to go back one more time yeah. before we move on in the conversation, you had mentioned that interconnection is really the foreseeable bottleneck right now. And then even out to five years from now, interconnection is going to be what slows down and really hinders all of this renewable energy getting on and supplying power to people. I have to ask, why is interconnection so slow to be built out? And, and I'm asking that because I'm thinking about, you know, that it's great for Bitcoin miners right now because they can come in and co-locate on site at these renewable generators and soak up all of this, you know, what would have been negatively priced power. But what is the delay? What takes so long on interconnect build out? Well, you're going to open up Pandora's box here. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> but, but unlike most Pandora box openings, you're going to like this one. I think it synergizes uh, with a lot of the discussions that we've had in the past. But essentially with the interconnecting queue, you know, what needs to happen is, the ISO needs to get comfortable with what's coming on their system. Whether that's a load or generation, the ISO wants to know about it, wants to understand how those power flows are going to affect the grid and make sure that it doesn't pose transmission constraints on the system that is going to cause 
very severe price dislocations and okay. potential disruptions to service. You had so many different incentives, whether they're tax incentives, state subsidies, um, cheap access to capital over the past, you know, four or five years. Yeah. And then the whole ESG push. So everyone just went gung ho at trying to build renewable energy projects, um, battery storage projects, pretty much anything. And you also had miners interconnecting. You had the data centers from some of the large tech companies growing. Um, and it really put a strain on the ISO and the internal resources at the ISO to really evaluate and do the studies of, hey, what is this asset going to do to the grid? Um, so that's kind of one of the main bottlenecks. And it kind of spills into the next one, which is the transmission system. The transmission system in this country, everyone knows, is, is archaic, and it takes a long time to put together the moder modernization upgrades that are needed to bring areas where there's, you know, a high supply of wind or a high supply of solar and make sure that all of that renewable energy can be transported to a load center, such as mm. Houston or Dallas or New York City. Um, and so without transmission build out and without incentives to fix the interconnection queue, we're going to be stuck in the same problem here. Yeah. Um, and I think the ways that we're going about solving it are trying to put more buckets of projects. Does your bucket fit into one of these 10 buckets? And now we're trying to say, Hey, does your project fit in one of these 25 buckets and that will better channel it to those experts. But the ISO needs to incentivize smart engineers, for lack of a better term, who want to work for them and want to go through all these process and studies. And you can equate it to you know, a lot of a lot of federal jobs. Um, definitely not an expert on this, but sure, fair enough. If someone's worked at the ISO and the interconnection queue for say three years, you better believe that one of these renewable energy companies are going to start offering them some quite lucrative salaries to leave. So is there something that can be done on the state side or the federal side to help maybe um, create some incentives to get some, some talented minds in to, to fix this process is, is something that, that I start to ask, but, you do yeah. see the federal government now starting to take action and, and kind of force more collaboration to, to start to address the interconnection and start to address the transmission problem. Sure. Oh, I appreciate that. I It's one of those things, you're not the first person to say that the, the interconnection is is either the bottleneck or, you know, really the, the, the problem with, you know, expansion and growth of the electrical grid system. Um, I, I'm also curious, you know, we're talking a lot about generation and demand and, you know, the, th the theme of the show is Bitcoin mining and, and the energy industry coming together. I would be really curious to get your take on, do you think there's any concern about this growth and the growth trajectory of Bitcoin mining as it relates to the utility companies in, in so much as that? Do you think the Bitcoin mining industry is going to stop becoming an actual tool because there's so much demand for it? Or are we getting too much into game theory and <laughs> speculation at that point? I think that's, I think that's a great point. Um, and, and my frank answer would be no. Uh, I think that what we're seeing from the energy side of the business is that people are starting to realize that whether they like it or not, they're competing with other renewable projects on the grid. And those other renewable projects may have different subsidies, different investors, different tax credits. And in order for them to compete, they need to come up with two things, either pretty quick and strong trading expertise to manage through periods of curtailment or start working with a controllable load behind the meter. 
Um, and I, I guess it could be in front of the meter as well, too. Um, and that really comes to play in Bitcoin mining. And from our conversations that we've had with many of our clients, I would say go back a year ago. It's pretty much a nice conversation to have once over a beer and they're not interested. Now we're having in-depth conversations with C-suite of companies and I'd say large renewable development companies who have over four or five gigawatts already operational. They are using Bitcoin mining, data centers, controllable loads as a resource to either get their projects financed or manage curtailment risk as a long-term solution because that transmission line that they were banking on being built in 2025 is now potentially going to be built in 2030. Oh and my so gosh. What are you going to, <laughs> what are you going to do in those next five years? Are you going to cross your fingers and hope the market's kind to you? Or are you going to take a proactive creative approach and partner with someone else that can solve your issue right now? And to put yeah. some numbers to it, you know, we do it on the financial side and up against, say, if you did nothing and let your megawatt settle in the real time market, we're mm -hmm. adding about five to nine dollars a megawatt hour, which is pretty impressive when you look at a lot of these, you know, incumbents and project owners are negotiating over twenty five, fifty cents a megawatt hour. If you partner with a miner you could potentially be adding 20 to $30 a megawatt hour to your project cost. And yet a lot of people still trot to those big energy conferences to go and argue about that 25, 50 cents for the next 15 years. And 50 that cents. Pretty <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. So I see what you mean. There's going to be a tidal wave of of interest in generation that's going to soak up all of the the potential bitcoin mining that could come onto the network um wow that i mean again it's just for me this is becoming more and more not even bitcoin mining it's just an infrastructure play this is just a a, a really really awesome tool for electrical infrastructure which i think that has some staying power so that that's exciting so chris We've danced around it a little bit, and you've kind of touched on bits and pieces of what CWP Energy Solutions and what CWP Energy does. I would love for you to give me and the audience kind of the, the in-depth walkthrough. What does CWP Energy Solutions do, and how are you working with your customers? Yeah, so for, for us, um, CWP Energy Solutions um, was born out of CWP Energy. And to boil it down pretty simply, CWP Energy got very, very good at creating renewable intermittency. What does renewable intermittency mean for power prices in, in this certain area? And what does it mean in this certain area? And then capturing those spreads. So, you know, our, our founder, our president, Elaine, is, you know, the more and more renewable projects that get built, the more financial trading expertise these projects will need to first off manage risk. How are you going to survive through winter storm Yuri? How are you going to survive through winter storm Elliot? Or as Nate did such a good job um, from Outlaw, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago on your podcast, yeah. yep. basis risk. What if my asset is curtailed and my asset node is sitting at negative pricing, but I owe my off taker a certain amount of megawatts at a certain price. Now I have to eat that spread. And a lot of times that puts a lot of renewable projects in negative months during periods of high wind or high solar. So what CWP Energy Solutions does is we look to work and partner with clients. We augment their asset management teams and we give them all of the trading tools that we use to make money on a proprietary basis and make our trading tools and our strategies available and say, hey, tomorrow you're gonna to be facing some curtailment risk and you're gonna be facing a lot of basis risk that's going to negatively impact your cash flows. 
these are the actionable market decisions and strategy you should use to mitigate those negative cash outflows and or these are the opportunities we see in the market here's how you capture additional revenue streams to offset those negative cash flows so in summary we really look to partner with a lot of renewable project generators that are facing heavy curtailment or they have other risks that they weren't aware of when they got into the project and then secondarily once the risks are addressed we optimize those projects we leverage a proprietary platform that we built that can better predict day ahead pricing can better predict real-time pricing and we make that available to clients and we say hey in the end it's a dollar per megawatt optimization equation how can a generator sell their power at the highest dollar per megawatt value and then what we realized after you know working with with miners and talking with miners how do we flip that equation upside down and how do we optimize that dollar per megawatt value to the low side as if you're a miner you're a consumer of electricity and yep. the name of the game is how can you procure the cheapest amount of electricity yeah so we work with mining clients that have a variety of contracts some with the utility um, some via um, vp uh, virtual power purchase agreements yep. um, some purchasing from the grid on a, on a daily basis just as a generator would sell to the grid and we're saying in the wholesale markets we can help you purchase the electricity at the lowest cost by u- utilizing all the tools in our tool belt and what we look to do for both on the generation and the load side is kind of scrap the incumbent fee structure, which is dollar per megawatt hour fixed fee structure. If I make you ten million, if I lose you ten million, you pay me that fee. Mm-hmm. What we do is say, hey, we'll set the benchmark at whatever you're doing now. If you're a generator, how are you selling your electricity now? That's the benchmark. If you're a load a Bitcoin mine, how are you procuring your electricity now? We'll set that as the benchmark. And then whatever we add in terms of increasing revenues for generators, we want a percentage of that over the benchmark. And then for miners, the amount that we reduce cost by, we want a percentage of that. That always aligns our financial uh, incentives. It allows us to be transparent and be a partner that's you know, an actual partner other than the black box model, which has, you know, kind of plagued our industry for the past 15 years. And yeah. so that's kind of how we get involved in everything. Well, I really appreciate that. And what's, what's really great to hear is that, I mean, you touched on it briefly, but what what's good to hear is that you guys are approaching the, the generators you know, on behalf of the Bitcoin miners and saying, okay, look, how are you getting paid today? That's good. like, that's the benchmark. And then, and then you work from there. I think that helps set expectations. Um, you, you touched on it a handful of times. You guys really focus on renewable projects and it's no surprise to any of the listeners or even people that don't know Bitcoin or Bitcoin mining very well, but Bitcoin mining gets a pretty bad rap for, things like carbon emission and too much energy usage and how it, if at all is CWP managing like the narrative around Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining being like producing too much carbon emissions or being too power intensive. How are you guys navigating that conversation or do you not even go into that with your renewable generators? Yeah, I think for for us, there's two things that that Bitcoin mining and the energy industry has in common. Both of them are extremely complex to the regular citizen. And that enables the narrative to be spun relatively easily. And yes, (laughs) since people can't understand the complexities of it, you know, it's very easy to write an article or to publish some, you know, study in a silo and say, you know, this is, this is bad. This is good. Um, you know, you can pretty much write that about, about anything. 
Um, I think what we look to do is obviously, you know, I think everyone wants to push for a cleaner grid, um, for a more reliable grid, um, and to offset carbon emissions. I think what people don't like to talk about is what they don't know um, yeah. about voltage control, um, about you know transmission infrastructure that actually is redundant as opposed to you know you're building a new project just because you're trying to make money on it. And I think by enabling partnerships, we're sharing the same story, and if battery storage can receive tax benefits and tax incentives and, and be applauded for their flexibility. I think so can controllable loads. And if battery storage can offset the need for an expensive transmission build because it's a flexible resource, so can a controllable load. Mm-hmm. And I think what people need to start looking at and, and what we focus on with, with mining clients and, and renewable energy clients is when you have a new project, you know, if you build five solar projects next to each other, they're just offsetting each other. They're not necessarily mm-hmm. offsetting right. a fossil resource right. that is needed for potential voltage control and reliability. Um, so we look at it and we run power flow models and say, hey, if you built a mine here, all it's doing is consuming stranded energy and it's providing voltage control to the grid. And it's also providing a flexible resource that participates in ancillary services. And that is not increasing its carbon footprint or increasing the grid's carbon footprint. Yeah. And so we we try and look at it from a more holistic uh, approach. And I think miners, especially of recent, are very, very cognizant and specifically tell us we're not interested in these type of resources, we're mostly focused on this resource. Or, hey, we've had grid purchases for 30 or 40 percent of our power. How can we best offset that? And we don't want to just go and buy the cheapest renewable energy credit on the market. We want to purchase something that's impactful to the communities that we're a part of now. So that's the thought process that's been going on. And I think that thought process is only going to develop and grow uh, into a more productive conversation. Oh, that's fantastic. And what a, what a good narrative. I hope that that narrative can start to spread into the, to just the general population. You're absolutely right with your opening statement to that question of when people don't get it, they're just going to publish the easiest clickbaitiest type of article that they can. And unfortunately that, that is, you know, to the detriment of Bitcoin mining. So I really hope that the, the narrative I really hope that the narrative can turn and become this is going to soak up that renewable energy. It's going to soak up that that stranded energy. Um, That's great. So I think. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I I think uh, just as a perfect example for for people, at least in our industry, you know, look at when, you know, China banned uh, Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin mining came to North America. Look where the Bitcoin mining was built, you know, back in, you know, 2017, 18, 19. Um, it was built in high renewable, low load areas. The Dakotas, the Pacific Northwest that had a lot of hydro um, in West Texas. And now look at what's happening. You know, I said this in the beginning, but the cyclical nature of the markets is going to start changing that. So mm-hmm. the Bitcoin mining is only soaking up branded energy at the end of the day. And if you have a look at West Texas, there's a lot of wind there. There's a lot of solar. Everyone said, hey, this is the cheapest area to build a mine. Well, this past two months, if you look at it, the load zone West Coast that everyone who has a load settles at was $45. Yeah. The liquidly traded area in North Texas that settled at $30. So Load Zone West was actually the highest price area. And you saw a lot of mining. And what we see is you've invested all of this money in there. You're not going anywhere. And a majority of the days, you are soaking up stranded electricity. But a miner has 
to have energy trading expertise to be able to stay online and operating during high priced or moderately high priced days. And I think that that's why we've been so involved in growing in the mining community is because you're not going to spend tens of millions of dollars and then just shut it down for months at a time just because energy prices are too high. You no. need yeah. active hedging and active management, just like renewable projects need active hedging and active management, just like oil and gas industry uses active hedging and active management to survive during cyclical, unfavorable you know, conditions in the market. So I think that's what I really want to get across in terms of there's a cyclical nature in our markets, and it's just following where the high penetration of renewables is when it comes to the power markets and making sure you're prepared to capture the good times and survive through the bad times. And if, if so, you're going to be a pretty successful company at the end of the day. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and what's exciting is people like yourself and CWP Energy Solutions is coming into the Bitcoin mining industry in a big way and, and really helping with that strategy. And it's it's going to be really fun to watch the industry mature. And, you know, it's for most people who aren't looking at it the way that we look at it, it it's going to be that like, oh, my gosh, how did this all happen so quickly? And it's like, well, it's been building up. Um, so, Chris, as we kind of wind down the conversation here, just to, to kind of bring things to a close, I always like to ask, you know, what what challenges might you foresee in this convergence of Bitcoin mining and the energy industry? Do you see any challenges in the, the near term or, or far future state of this? Yeah, um, I think the biggest challenge that, that we're facing now is we've, work with our renewable clients. We perform very well. We've helped them, you know, turn unprofitable projects into profitable projects, but they're looking for a long-term solution. They're in areas where more and more renewables are coming online. The transmission's not going to save them. So they need mining or they need a data center, you know, whatever that controllable load is. They need something to help soak up that power during high, you know, wind or solar hours. Mm -hmm. And they're interested in doing it. They're ready to do a contract today. The mining community or the data center or the controllable load is ready to do a contract today. The utility is not. And it's not for a lack of necessarily want. It's more for a lack of this is something that we haven't done before. And these are the contract structures and rate classes that we have. So why can't you just fit into one of those? And I think we've seen some of the larger utilities um, or, you know, you look at Otter Tail Power. I was on a call today and Otter Tail got Power got brought up as kind of a, a great business case where you have high yeah. renewable penetration, you don't have a lot of load, and you are saying, well, I need 100 megawatts for mining. And they're saying, well, that's a little bit too much right now, but if we do 20 megawatts, we can do that. And what comes with that? It comes with transmission investment from the mining company. It comes for more tax benefits for the community. And it really starts to change the ecosystem and the economics that are in that area. But that's just a small microcosm where I think that story needs to start spreading to other areas and kind of helped me and, and my clients who have wanted nothing to do with Bitcoin mining. Now they, they're fully committed to get involved in Bitcoin yeah. mining. And now yeah. it's the utility that we need to say, like, hey, we are not increasing your peak load. We are giving you a curtailable resource that you are able to control and curtail during times of peak and stress on the system. Also, the grid isn't going to be modernized by federal investment incentives. The grid is going to be moder modernized at a local level. And that comes from bringing in a data center, bringing in a miner, bringing in a controllable load that solves the renewable procurement issue and also uses that investment money to, you know, I should say, modernize their section of the grid. And if you have more and more people do that, 
now there's less tax dollars that need to flow from the federal level to you know incentivize that transmission build out and you start to see a bigger story but right now what we're trying to get through is that initial education phase initial you know proponent phase and i think everyone pulling in the same direction and understanding that mining or large flows on the system aren't you know something that's geared to just soak up power it's here as a flexible resource to modernize the grid and the quicker utilities start thinking more creatively about that um, i think the quicker we'll start to see a, a solution um, to reliability problems and and also to to a lot of the volatility that we've been seeing in the market i was really happy to hear that your foreseeable challenge is not like a foundational fundamental technical thing with bitcoin mining but rather it's an education piece we can get through education um it'll be slow it'll be a little painful at times but we can do education um so it's exciting to hear that you know from your perspective which is a very deep background in both industries you see education as the 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 bottleneck there that's great chris i like to leave room at the end of the show for my guests to to give a handoff i want um the utility companies listening and the Bitcoin mining companies listening to be able to get in touch with you and CWP. Um, so please give a handoff for yourself and, and CWP. Yeah, absolutely. Ben, thank, thanks for, uh, for having me on. This has been a great conversation um, for me. Um, you can reach, uh, reach us at uh, CWP Energy Solutions. Uh, my email is chris at cwpenergy.com. Um, we'd love to engage in more conversations on the mining side, on the energy side. Um, on the education side, most importantly, and uh, we'll be at uh, uh, Bitcoin uh, 2023 in Miami. So I look forward to seeing a lot of people there. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, this this conversation's been, uh, I'm sorry for the cheesy pun. It's been very energizing. It's the end of the day over a happy hour. Love it. Um, I, I would have cracked another beer and go another hour with you. This has been great. Um, thank you. And you take care. All right. Thanks a lot, Ben. Take care. Bye.